here at one o'clock, that's now back. So we're uh, slightly getting back to normal in that way. Uh, so if anybody new here today, we're going to give people an opportunity to get baptised as well. Behind the curtain there is a baptism tank. And we're hopefully you might make your peace with God today. So we're going to turn to Second Kings in chapter 20. Second Kings in chapter 20. So the talk today is strength through God. And there are different uh, ways of looking at strength. You can have um, strength of mind, um, strength of character, in people's characteristics that can be strong, uh, like telling the truth against an onslaught of punishment that you might get. You've got this thing inside you that determines that you're going to speak the truth no matter the consequences because that's the strength that you're having. You're leaning on your, your characteristics that you might have. Um, we've got back in 1972 with the Olympics that was uh, uh, heralded and spoken of as being a, a time or they, they pillared it as being a great message of joy and peace. In 1972 in the Olympics there was uh, the Munich Massacre where a number of uh, Olympians had lost their life and there was one guy by, by the name of Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Gartland who was a weightlifter who when he saw the, what had happened was the PLO had um, um, assassinated eventually, but had taken hostage a number of the Olympiad uh, people from the Israeli uh, members that would come over from Israel to represent their country. And 1972 this was, earmarked as a great time of peace. Uh, West Germany was particularly wanting to be a time of great joy. And then there was this uh, great uh, massacre but at one point there, when one of the uh, weightlifters, you saw some of the people coming up with hoods on their face, black hoods, straight away you realised something was up, and he held his, pushed his weight, his weightlifter, a strong man, against the door, um, giving enough to warning for his fellow Olympians to get away, and I think 10 people got their lives preserved. He lost his own life through that. So that's strength, the strength of character, Strength of just pure force that he's able to lean his body on that door as the, as the people from PLO were trying to make their way in to take these people hostage. Um, you can have, you know, Superman, he's a, able to leap buildings and he's a strong, powerful Clark Kent, you know, guy takes off his glasses. And um, we can have an Irish guy by the name of John Evans who decided one day he wanted to put his mini mine on his head. <laughs> And it's a world record. An Irishman by the name of John Evans was able to hold a mini mine on his head for a 33 seconds. And that's amazing, isn't it? You're, you're spellbound with that, aren't you? <laughs> Typical Irish, you might say. I don't know. But that's what he did. He decided one day, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a mini mine on my head <laughs> for 33 seconds. And he did. <laughs> um, and then you've got um, Bolto, the dog, in 1925. This is pretty renowned. I think they've made some... Walt Disney codons about him. He was a Siberian husky dog. There was a diphtheria running throughout America. 15,000 children lost their lives in a couple of years earlier. And they're up in Alaska. They, they, they needed to get some insulin to these children that weren't able to do that. So a slate of dogs went through a storm 700 miles. And one of the dogs was instrumental in making sure that they got to the next town where they could get some penicillin, etc., back to the town where they were from. And that's a famous story of incredible strength of dog, you know, fighting elements of minus 50 degree blizzards, snow across ice sheets of rivers. And he went all the way there and made it all the way back. And, and that's a famous story. There's all different types of strength. But today we're looking at um, strength in God. And in verse 1, it says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. He's the king. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set your house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. He then turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore, lost all his strength. Bad day. His age, at this point in time, he's aged 39 years of age. So let's go back 
if we can, to 2 Kings in chapter 18. And we're going to go back to see what sort of a life that this guy had up until this time, this king. In 2 Kings in chapter 18, Hezekiah is, begins to reign. Verse 2, 25 years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abbey, the daughter of Zechariah. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He was a very decent man at the time. And in verse 6, For he clave unto the Lord, departed not from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. So he was a... A uh, really decent king right from the very beginning. If we go to Second Chronicles, we're going to go and have a look at the same story but from Chronicles. Second Chronicles in chapter 29. A swig of water if you don't mind. Second Chronicles 29. And we see here in verse 3 in the first year of his reign that's um, a phone it might be my phone too <laughs> I can hear it over there um, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord in the first year of his reign he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them now if you look up in verse 24 of chapter 28 and Ahaz, his father, gathered together the vessels of the house of God, cut in pieces the vessel of the house of God, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, and he made altars in the, every corner of Jerusalem. And he did some terrible things. Here, his first year, first time, he's opening the doors of the house of the Lord and repairing it. He brought in the priests, the Levites, and gathered them together on the east street. And he commanded them to, do, to get everything right. Our fathers, verse 6, have trespassed and done that which is evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and they've turned their backs. They've shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burnt incense nor burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. And down in verse 10, it is now in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not, be not now diligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. And he did that. So he's got this king at the very beginning of his reign, just having a real desire to get it right with God to really make an effort to show what God could do and what he'd seen God do he was a strong powerful 25 year old leader of the people of Judah and he wanted to have that relationship with God and he wanted everybody else to have it too in verse 18 they said to the king Hezekiah we have cleansed all the house of the Lord and the altar of the burnt offering with all the vessels thereof and show bread table with all the vessels thereof. It took in verse 17, it took them 16, 16 days to do that. And if we go to verse 30, Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praises unto the Lord with the words of David, Asap the, and, uh, Asap the seer and they sang praises with gladness and they bowed their heads and worshipped obviously the Lord and at verse 36 and Hezekiah rejoiced and all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly he begins to reign and that is his fingerprint of what he wants to be remembered as a strong God-fearing leader and why was he strong when his father was so bad so corrupted it was something in here in his heart that he desired a truth with the Lord we've heard these things in our testimonies here today let's go 
bit further back to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. Chapter 18. Now we're looking at a couple of years later. So at 39 years of age, you're going to die, Hezekiah. The prophet Isaiah has said to him, you're going to do that. This is 25 years of age. And now we're here in verse 9. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Eli, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. At the end of the three years, they took it, even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Halar and in Harbor by the river of Gozan in the cities of the Medes, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his commandment, covenant, and all that Moses' servant, all that Moses, servant of the Lord, commanded, and would not hear them nor do them. So there it is for the next few years. Um, uh, Hezekiah is watching Israel, the house of Israel, being taken away and controlled by the king of Assyria, this formidable king. And he has his own battles. He starts off as a strong, inspirational leader. And then we've got these three or four years. He's now seeing things happening around him, but he's still maintaining his strength because he's relying on the Lord. He's now gone from the fourth year, which is 29 years of age, to 31. He's seen a lot in his life, but he's been determined to be a strong, powerful, God-fearing leader as a young man. And then it says in the 14th year, verse 13, now he's at the age of 39, king of the king Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against the fenced cities of Judah to took them? Up in verse 7, the Lord was with Hezekiah, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. At this point in time, Hezekiah is feeling the burden of office as a king. He's really weighed down by life, and life can do that to us. We've just had a number of years of our COVID restrictions. If you remember at the very beginning, when there was uh, on our TVs, there'd be people were dying in China, and uh, airports were being shut down all over the country. People are being sent home. Uh, offices and cities are just desolate. You could see photos of main cities around the world. There wasn't a person in sight. And people were wondering about their life, what was going to happen. The, the normality of life just suddenly changed. And the burden of life, we've had two and a half years of that. And it's burdened some people pretty hard and, and just life. Well, here's Hezekiah. He's a king. He's a leader. He's a ruler of God's people. He's got the burden of office. He's trying to do the right by the Lord. He, as we said there in the very beginning, suddenly he comes into power and he really wants to do it right. But he's just got worn down a little bit and starts to negotiate. When he rebelled against his king of Assyria, now we see he's starting to negotiate with that king. Verse 14, I have offended halfway through. Return from me. That which thou puttest me, I will, I will bear. So there's a negotiation there that Hezekiah is doing with this king. In verse 17, the king of Assyria sent Tartan, Rabasa, Rabshka, and Lachish, the kings of he to King Hezekiah, with a great host against Jerusalem. There's 184,000 soldiers, and they went up. And came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduits of the upper pool, which is the highway of the Fuller's Field. This is a prime land and prime bit of spot where um, this propaganda 
of wearing away the people. In the Second World War, you had Tokyo Rose, which was a radio station that was put out by the Japanese to, to demoralise the Allied troops. Tokyo Rose, and it'd always be how bad the Allied forces were doing and how many people were losing their lives and you're just wasting your time fighting the Imperial Japan. We had uh, Lord Hau Hau, who was also a one for a British guy. He spoke with a very upper, uh, snobby accent, if you like, very British. And his idea, his, his role was to also demoralise the troops against uh, Germany at the time. So there's propaganda machines that work. They reckon the first casualty of war is the truth. So people are pushing out propaganda, and we've even heard this today with what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia. There's propaganda going out there right now, getting the people, swaying the people's minds. Well, this guy here was trying to sway the people of God. And in verse 10, Rabshka said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they that be vain words, I have counsel and strength of war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me, the king of Assyria? And he gives a list of all the other failed attempts that have happened. Verse 22, But if you say unto me, We trust in the Lord our God, is not he whose high places, whose altars, Hezekiah, has taken away? That's the first thing he did. And now he's been ridiculed as doing that. You shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now therefore I pray thee, give pledge to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses, if you be able to part and set riders upon them. You haven't got 2,000 people, you're done, you're finished. So we're going to give you these horses and you won't even be able to fill the saddles of the, of the horses that we're going to provide. Verse 25. Now this is him at 39 years of age. He's sick. And he's got this thing happening with the king of Assyria coming. At the beginning of his reign, he's there, he's powerful, he's strong. He can, he's just got the power of God. And we have our walks like that, where some days we can conquer the universe. And other days, the burden of life just weighs us down and it all gets pretty murky in our minds. And he says here, and now, am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. This is what this spokesman is saying on behalf of the king. We've been sent by the Lord God to destroy Jerusalem. So you're wasting your time fighting us. And uh, down in verse... Uh, 28 Rabshkeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jewish language the Jews language and spoke saying hear the word of the great king the, the king of Assyria thus saith the king let not Hezekiah deceive you for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord saying the Lord will surely deliver us and this city shall not be delivered in the hands of the king of Syria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me uh, by a present, and come out to me, and then eat every man of his own vine and his own fig tree, and you should drink every man of water over their own cistern. And down to verse 32. Until I come to you, this is the propaganda machine working against the people. And it's in their language. In a verse, few verses earlier, that when the propaganda machine was talking, they actually said, can you talk in the Syrian language, not to the Jewish language? We don't want our people to hear what threats you're, you're saying to us here. And they reply by speak, speaking and yelling in a loud voice, 
in a Jewish language to the people that were listening. And in verse 32, Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread vineyards, a land of olive and honey, that you may live and not die and hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuades you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. This is not a strong day in the nation at the time. These are not strong people. And we we're talking about strength through God. Hezekiah's name, name means strength. Strong in God. That's what his name means. He's ruling a people that are now floundering away. Hezekiah had told the people earlier on, if we look here in verse 36, but the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. So that was the message that Hezekiah was to his people. Just wait. He didn't know what to do. In chapter 19... He um, rents his clothes. The people that are hearing rent their clothes. In verse 3, they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy, for the children are come to birth and are set, and there is not strength to bring forth. So this is a bad day. No strength at all. At all. But we're talking about strength in God or through God today. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about physical strength. Some of our most difficult days that we can have in our life are when we have no strength at all. Just thinking about Phil Caffrey. I don't know if Rebecca's here, but when Phil Phil and Carol, do you remember Phil? With your F one hundred coming on the way to camp and they had an accident and the car rolled, landed on Rebecca. Is that right? Try lifting a F-100 without your strength. But when you've got a need, boy, where does the strength come from? And they lifted that car and Rebecca's alive today with her own two children. Um, you hear of stories, I was just reading one today about a, two helicopter pilots and, and they had an accident and the co-pilot was drowning because the helicopter in very shallow waters. He was able to lift the, the pilot that survived off of, lift the helicopter off his co-pilot. There was a story of a young boy who uh, an engine mount fell onto his father's chest and was um, you know, obviously dying because of the weight. And this boy lifted the car off of his dad. And then later on, this is in the UK, they got that same boy to see what he could do without that fear of losing his dad. And all he could do was just get the, the bumper bar, it was just the springs. There's something about strength that we have in our hour of need. And spiritually, there is no strength in the people here. They're, they've been told there's 185,000 soldiers ready to seize the land. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He's got you in trouble when you, when he, you've, before when you rebelled against us. So he says it's a day of trouble. And then, verse 5. So the servants of the king Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, which the servants of the king of Syria hath blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumour and shall return to his own land and I'll cause him to fall by the sword of his own land. And that's what happened to him. This king died, which we'll read a bit later. So, so Hezekiah really was relying on the Lord at that time. And if you want to go to chapter 20... At this time, Hezekiah is sick with his own life, with all the other things that we've read about. And in verse 3 again of chapter 20, with all that we've read and where he's come from, and I beseech thee, O Lord, remember how I've walked with thee in truth with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore, not just for his own life, but for all that was before him. And it came to pass... That to pass a four Israel was gone into the middle court. So he's 
He's come into here, Isaiah. So I'll be the king if you like. That says, Isaiah comes in, tells me, Kern, get your life and all, you're going to die, okay. And then he goes out a four. The word of four it means um, something that's just been done recently. So he's now walking back away from the king. And the word of the Lord comes to, to Isaiah and says, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God of David, Thy father, I have heard your prayers, have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee, and on the third day thou shalt go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add unto the days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city with my own, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. What an amazing moment. You've got this fear of war. You're worried about your people. You're dying. You've been told you're going to die. Now, if you were the prophet Isaiah, <laughs> and you have to tell me, the king, hey, Kernhan, you're dying. Now, Isaiah and, and Hezekiah had a good relationship. They, they supported each other. And they knew each other really well. They loved the idea of this this king of Judah and the nation Judah being really strong for God and, and righteous and following the truth. So they've got this really good relationship. And your mate comes and tells you, get your house in order, you're going to die today. How you would feel if you're walking away from that king and then the word of the Lord comes to you again and says, go back and tell Kernhan, King Kernhan, <laughs> your prayers have been answered. You'd be pretty pumped. You'd be running back. What? I'd be pumped. If it was me, I'd be, I'd be feeling bad that I've got to deliver the message. Because um, he's my mate. We, we, we walk in the house of the Lord together and we've seen some battles and we've seen this God working in our lives. We've seen miracles. And I've got to tell that king, you're finished. And then the word comes to me again. Well, I would have been running back. Hey, Hezekiah, your prayers have been answered. That strength, not his strength, but God's strength. And that happens in our walk on the Lord. We have days we're on fire, we can conquer the universe. And there are days when things just aren't going well in our life. And it's that prayer that we have to God, a God that answers our prayers. That's what keeps us alive. And all the people said, let's go to Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. And same story. This is now Isaiah writing his account. And we're now going to read what, Isaiah, what Hezekiah said as he turned his face to the wall. Verse 9, the writings of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered out of his sickness. Verse 10, I said in the cutting off my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I'm deprived of the residue of my years. I'm going to die at 39 years of age. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord in the land of the living. Remember, he wept. And turned his face to the wall. This is when our reading what he was actually saying. When the Lord said, I've heard your prayers, I've heard your voice, and I've heard your tears. Uh, I said, I will not see the Lord, even the Lord, in the land of the living. I shall behold man no more with the habitations of the world. I'm going to be cut off, no, all my family and friends. Mine age is departed and is removed from me like a shepherd's tent tent that folds up and has moved to a new location I've cut off like a weaver of my life he will cut me off with a pining sickness pining is just a sorrowful soul a really sad sorrowful pining away in his soul of the lamentation that was upon him by Isaiah saying you're going to die as well as a formidable army that's right on the doorstep of his, of his nation he had things to do there was things he was planning on doing with God. But he was being told, this is it. 
From day even to night will they make an end of me. I reckon till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones. From day even to night will they make an end of me. This is the end of my life. This is not a real good... Like a crane or a swallow did I chatter, calling out to the Lord, chatter, chatter, whispering, yelling out to the Lord, Brrr, Lord. I did mourn as a dove. My eyes fell with looking upward. O oh, Lord, I'm oppressed. Undertake for me. You can sort of see and feel the determination of just calling out to God because that's all he had. There was nothing else. And it's just in sheer desperation. If we read those words again, my eyes fail for looking upward. He's just pleading up into the heavens. Please hear me. Reverse this situation. What shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all the years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live. That's the, what we have apportioned to us. And in all these things is the life of my spirit. So will that recover me and make me to live? For behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins from behind, back behind. For the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. Father, the children shall make known the truth. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs into the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. And he was recovered. Great story. The Lord, if we read in Isaiah, he says, The Lord has heard your prayers and your tears. That strength that we have. And that's what happens in our walk in the Lord. There are days when we can conquer the universe and there are days when we have no strength at all but the strength of the knowledge that God hears our prayers and he answers them. And there's tremendous strength in that example that we have. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians in chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And you've all got the stories that you can, ha you can have and tell. Um, we've all have a God that answers our, our, our lives and our, our prayers that we have. When, when all else fails, we know that God hears our prayers and he, he wants to respond to them. And when we get an answer, how good does that feel to know that the Lord God do that? When our daughter uh, Vicky was born, so we're over in London... That's our first child. We've got all our family back here. Um, so there was a long um, labour. We had a, a Malaysian midwife. Um, she was our, the midwife there for probably about six to eight hours. And there was complications. At one point, the, the midwife said, your baby's very sick. I'd like to have some prayer. Now, this is the National Health over in London. National Health Service, you're not allowed to talk about religion or God or anything like that. It's just forbidden. So this was a big step in faith for her, I thought at the time. Uh, so I said, oh, yeah, we're Christians too. And she said, um, oh, no, 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 I've received the Holy Spirit. I said, yeah, so have we. Oh, no, no, I speak in tongues. Oh, so do we. So um, we prayed. And then when Vicky was, she was starved of oxygen when she was born. So when she came, when she was delivered, she was um, anemic and you know, there was just no life in her. She wasn't crying or anything. She whisked up into the ICU ward in the hospital straight away. They do all these tests and the, and the tests came back. She's either going to have uh, uh, permanent disability, brain damage. Debatable. No, joking. <laughs> <laughs> joking. <laughs> um, brain damage or incompatible with life. You have these sort of tests, 0 to 10, whatever it was, and she didn't get over 2. Um, 24 hours later, now we had no, we, if you like, we, we just had God. We didn't know, first kid, who knows, he knows how that all works, when you're having a baby and all that. So it's just, you just get rolled along with all these doctors and comments and terminology that you don't even know about. So 
24 hours later, she's made a full, total recovery. But you know what? We never saw that midwife ever again. Just the one day in our lives where you got, bang, the Lord undertaking. That's the power of God in our lives. And all the people said, that's our God. That's how he works. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I didn't pray that she'd be dumber than me because she outsmarts me and always beats me in my arguments. So as I should have said, Lord, make her humble as well. But I didn't. <laughs> First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, sorry. So whatever is besetting you today, God hears your prayer. Chapter 12, did I say? Chapter 12, sorry. Chapter 12, 2 Corinthians, verse 9. Paul's got some sort of situation in his life. doesn't go into any detail. He sought the Lord at three times. It says in verse 8, that it might depart from me. And in verse 9, he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, this word in the Greek means my miraculous revealing power, is made perfect in your vulnerability, word weakness. When you're feeling like you've got no answers, and maybe there are people here today who need to be baptised and filled with the Holy Ghost. Maybe there are people here who hadn't quite got their walk. You've, took, you've taken off like a, like a rocket. Suddenly you're making everything clear. You've given up everything. You're telling everybody you're born again. And life has sort of knocked you about a bit where you're starting to negotiate with the world. Like Hezekiah did, as well as his own sickness. His strength came back when he turned and put his full being back to God. And we want to be strong leaders of our people, of our t generations, of our time. Then we, we, we need to be reminding ourselves about how much prayer works in our life. And just repeating here in the Greek, for my strength, my miraculous working power is made perfect when you're vulnerable, when you don't feel like you've got an answer, when you're feeling like the world is crushing you, then it works. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproach and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I'm vulnerable, then am I strong and my prayers are answered. We've got a great work in God in our lives. Let's go to 1 John in chapter 2. 1 John. So it's our God. Today's talk is, remember, strength through God. Come along and be baptised here today. It works in your life. It will work. It does work. Feeling vulnerable, feeling exposed, feeling weak, got a sickness... God's answering your prayers today. Come to orders there, get baptised. Saints, brothers and sisters that we are, feeling a bit vulnerable because of life, you know, things happen. Come to the prayer line, have some prayer tomorrow. We're going to have a prayer line or prayer time. Just give it to the Lord. Let the Lord say to you, this day I've heard your prayers. I've heard them. And let him show his power in your life. That's what he wants to do. First John in chapter 2. And it says, verse 13, I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. We've got a lot of strength in this room, but let us not measure strength by what might be happening in our life. Let us measure strength by the fact that when we turn to God, he answers his people. And all the people said, let's leave it there. We're going to have a time of prayer.